everybody. We've got a, a fun one today, you know, for a change. Heidi Heitkamp is with me. Uh, we recorded this on a Tuesday afternoon, a week after the election. Trump, of course, was scheduled to speak later that evening. And uh, in this, uh, you'll hear Heidi takes a bold stab at what Trump is going to say. She said it was going to be him doubling down on the 2020 election being stolen. Uh, it was going to be all fiery grievance, as she said, and 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 because uh, that's what he does. But Heidi was completely wrong, and man, he really should have called her for advice. Uh, first of all, the speech was a mess. It's a very odd combo of a, a written speech laying out his tremendous achievements as as president, how strong the nation was under him, and then what a piece of shit it's become in the short two years since uh, Biden's been there, uh, with a mishmash of riffing about his grievances, uh, back to the written text, uh, back to him free associating, and it was just a, a mess. Uh, Fox cut away from the speech. People in the audience there at mar lago just started leaving, and he had to sweep up which is a bad look. Now, as you listen to this, you'll get right away that Heidi and I enjoy each other very much. I really love Heidi. And I want to mention something that I don't really talk about here on the show, uh, which is my resignation. Now, I had 36 of my Democratic colleagues demand that I resign. Nine since then have acknowledged publicly that they realized that that was a mistake that I, I deserve due process. And I really appreciated that. And Heidi is one of those. And I've had a number of them on the podcast, John Tester, Tammy Duckworth, Sheldon Whitehouse, and, and, and Heidi now for the second time. And sometimes folks will write in and say, you shouldn't have them on. And, but, but that's why. That's why. Um, John and Tammy and Sheldon and uh, Heidi are, are all friends. So enough of that. On Trump, Uh, remember when he said I could stand in the middle of Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and I wouldn't lose any votes? And that was probably true, but he'd be prosecuted for shooting someone. He's running for president. He's still got a big base, but he's going to be prosecuted in Georgia. I know that's going to (laughs) happen. for the top secret classified documents, and for January 6th. How will that all play out? The next two years are going to be a shit show, folks. In Congress, uh, in the House especially, all I can say is, as a Chinese comedian once said, may you live in ridiculous times. Heidi Heitkamp is up. It's a great one, you know for a change. The thing about in North Dakota and Minnesota that when it snows, then it just stays for the rest of the winter, right? Well, and and, um, what happened in Fargo, here it didn't, we didn't have the rain and the ice before the snow, so underneath it's not icy. In Fargo, it's just sheer ice underneath the snow, which is always tough. Well, yeah, just for uh, our audience, Fargo is right next to Minnesota there, on the, north, <laughs> on the Red River of the North. Well, and you know that movie, Fargo? It's not about Fargo. It's about Brainerd, Minnesota. Yeah, but don't they pick up the car in Fargo? Is that what is that what? Yeah. It, yeah, well, yeah. I, think, I think he meets up with the hitman in Fargo originally. I think that's the plot. Oh, okay. Yeah. <laughs> and then he gets arrested. You know, he gets arrested in Bismarck. In Bismarck. Yeah, you know, that. oh, that's right. Yeah. You know, that's the only movie I've seen where people talk like normal. <laughs> uh, Isn't yeah, that your experience, think, you too? Know, <laughs> oh, my, my, my. And, you know, Al, I come by it really honestly, this accent that I yeah, have. Yeah, mine is a little, a little dishonest because, you know, I moved to Minnesota when I was four. <laughs> Uh, I'll tell you a, a little story. My dad was a New Yorker, but I grew up in Minnesota. We moved to Minnesota when I was four. 
Uh, so in 1991, when I was working on SNL, I'm living in New York. My dad's in Minnesota, and he has a diverticulitis attack. So my 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 friend calls me from Minneapolis and says, you better get home real quick. Your dad had this very severe diverticulitis attack. So I go to the, at LaGuardia, uh, get a plane. The plane doesn't take off. Long and short, I don't get to Minneapolis till like 2 in the morning. Get to the hospital at 3 in the morning. Go to the ICU. My dad looks like he's death. And I'm just going, oh, shit. My dad, my dad might die. So I'm standing there. It's like three in the morning. Nurse comes in. Uh, I say, I'm Joe Franken's son. She goes, oh, well, you don't, uh, you don't got a Minnesota accent either. And I said, well, I actually, I grew up here. She said, yeah, but you don't have a Minnesota accent. I said, yeah. And she said, well, and your dad certainly doesn't. And I say, well, yeah, but he's lived here 40 years. Well, he doesn't have a Minnesota accent. And my dad from the bed goes, not yet. <laughs> I go, dad. Great story. <laughs> so I, here I go, like, oh, my God, my dad, he might not make it. And that's what he comes up with. So that was my dad. He made it. He was fine. He, was <laughs> he got out of that. So, But, you know, you and I were part of the Oya caucus, right? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And yeah. the other one was just Grassley, you know. Yep. Chuck. And and honestly, the, the thing about about Al that was so much fun is if you had your back turned and he did the Bernie Sanders, you didn't know if it was Bernie or Al. Heidi. <laughs> Heidi, well, how are you voting on this? Because I have no idea. <laughs> it's a farm thing. I have. I, I don't know. It's and it's not dairy. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my God! Um, hi, hi, Heidi. Hi, Al. <laughs> hi. So uh, we had an election. It was midterm, and Franny said to me uh, on Wednesday night. She said uh, the American people said, "Stop it." <laughs> That's what she. That was her conclusion about what the election was. Yeah, I, I mean, it is it is um, so amazing that people have underestimated that freedom was on the ballot, underestimated that democracy was on the ballot. And they just don't want to go back to chaos. And so um, literally said, stop it. Stop taking away our rights. Stop taking away our democracy and start behaving yourself. This is my analysis of, of the Republican Party's. I'm talking about the um, elected officials and also the apparatchiks in, in the Republican Party. You can divide them into only two groups, and it's everyone. Chicken shits or crazies. <laughs> Which group's bigger? Chicken shits. <laughs> I just want, I, I, it's 70-30 or something like that. Well, maybe yeah, not. I, I'm not. The elected officials, it's 70-30. Yeah. That's what I mean. N not Republican voters. Right. I did a, a podcast um, with uh, the German Marshall Fund broadcasting into uh, Germany, and they asked about election deniers. And I said, you know, let's just calibrate this. These people know that the election was not stolen. They're just syncophats. They just are terrified of Trump and they're unwilling to say it. And so they aren't really election deniers. They're just chicken shit, as you said. Yeah. And and again, I, I should clarify that what you and I are, are talking a, about when we're saying that is that uh, the people who vote for Republicans, as opposed to the people who are elected and the people who run the campaigns, a much higher percentage of the people who vote Republican believe this stuff because they just get this disinformation from all these sources, Fox and, and OAN and Breitbart, Newsmax. You know, they get fed so much disinformation from all these sources from Fox, right-wing talk radio and Breitbart and social media. 
Yeah, now you see it happening right now with the gubernatorial race in Arizona. I mean, you know, I I just have been, you know, you follow it after the initial shock wears off uh, for the Republicans. They start trying to figure out what's going to be the excuse du jour. And now it's just, I mean, you can expect that uh, when the announcement is made, there will be tons of conspiracy theories about all of this. Yeah, and and Carrie Lake tweeted out, Arizonans know BS when they see it. And the thing is, yeah, that's why you lost. (laughs) Uh, My favorite burn there was Liz Cheney. You know, she sent a letter to Liz Cheney thanking her for her endorsement of Hobbes, you know, going on and on about how she had raised all this money. So Liz Cheney, you know, in the theory of revenge is a dish best served cold. Liz Cheney waited until after the election and then she sent her a little note just saying, you're welcome. I think Liz Cheney's endorsement mattered. I think um, taking and calling out the McCain family, saying you're going to put a stake through their heart and oh uh, asking McCain supporters to get the hell out of your rally. It just, I mean, that is not normal behavior. And so she only has herself to thank for, for losing a race that she shouldn't have lost. How stupid is that? How arrogant was that? Well, that's, 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 Yep. How arrogant is that? That's right. I mean, to say, well, she was convinced she was going to win without any sane Republican in the state, I guess, or any anyone who revered a guy who had been in a state at the Hanoi Hilton voluntarily. I mean, refused release because he knew that they would use it as propaganda. (laughs) Anyone who really kind of revered him at all, get away. Don't vote for me. Yeah, you're right. That's arrogant. But she's uh, she lost. So there. So uh, so let's talk about the Republican Party. I mean, we we can talk about let's talk about a lot of things. But the Republican Party, what's that going to be like uh, in Washington now? It, it's going to be a shit show, right? Well, I, I don't think there's any doubt about it. You've got <laughs> you're going to love this, Al. Ted Cruz is doing tons of interviews because he's one of the few that will stand up and say negative stuff about McConnell. And, and you know, he's he's used the P word that he has mm-hmm. peed off about what happened. And then he says, you know, what we really need. We need people to go down to the Senate and talk about the destructive democratic practices and be happy warriors. Now, would you ever describe Ted Cruz as a happy warrior? Wow. Yeah. A lot of people ask me what's wrong with him. And, uh, you know, because Ted is very smart. If you do like give an SAT test, to him, he'll do very well. But it's the self-awareness gene. Uh, he did not get that. So <laughs> the, when he says happy warrior, it's amazing. Ted Cruz is an amazing uh, example of someone who uh, just isn't aware of how he comes off, right? Am I wrong about that? No, I think you're absolutely <laughs> right. He, you know, he is just, as I said, he is not self-actualized. <laughs> yeah, and I, I, maybe I don't know exactly what you mean because self-actualized, he's not a, a well-rounded full person, if that's what you mean. <laughs> or, I, but he doesn't he, understand What's wrong with him? Well, I mean, if you think about this, this is a man who repeatedly has been told by both sides of the aisle that he's not well liked, that he's he is not the smartest guy in the room on every occasion, that he needs to curb his enthusiasm for himself. And he's done nothing to fix the problems that he has to move to the next stage. And that he definitely wants to move to the next stage. He's decided that path has been paved by, by Donald Trump and he's going to stay with them. And, you know, but, but no one, no one that I know would describe Ted Cruz as a happy warrior. He is a sour, bitter, you know, mean, vindictive man. And, you know, that just oozes out of every pore in his body. Well, you know, he wanted to go to the next level right away. He ran for president as soon as he could. Right. And of course, you know, in that first campaign, uh, no one said worse stuff about 
Trump than than he did. He's he's part of the chicken shit uh, group <laughs> that I'm talking about, right? Yep, he's the yeah. leader. <laughs> I'm the leader of the chicken shits. I'm Ted. <laughs> you know, someone asked me when when will the fe- when will I know when the fever broke? Um, mm-hmm. The Donald Trump, you know, fever. And I said, when people like John Hoven and Todd Young and, you know, Todd Young didn't get an endorsement. Good for him. Neither did John Thune. But John Hoven did. And John Hoven knows better. And so when people like that in the Republican caucus say enough is enough, but now they all got these endorsements from Trump. Trump's going to call in those chips right? He's going to call in the, the endorsement chips. And what are they going to do? Say, I think you're bad for our party? Yeah. Well, again, that's the chicken shit caucus. And I think this will be fun to watch. And tonight, as we're talking, we're recording this on, on Tuesday. So <laughs> Trump, we haven't heard Trump's speech yet uh, announcing that he's running for president, right? Yeah. And, and, you know, by all accounts, they say he's going to, you know, my, my thing is that he's going to stand up and say, once again, you all failed because you're conceding elections. You should never concede. This has been stolen from you. We didn't lose this election. It was stolen. And he's going to go full on election denial on the midterm, call out all the Republicans for not being brave enough like he is and say the only way the Republican Party can win is if they have a leader who is willing to say what I'm going to say tonight, which is we're going to we're going to fight this. We we actually want one in Pennsylvania. I can just hear it. He's just going to go down the line, talk about how they won in Arizona, how they won in Pennsylvania, how they won in Nevada, and it was taken away from him. And he is the only savior who can restore democracy. And, and you know, I, I mean, I could write his speech tonight. If you had asked me to predict what he said, I, 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 I had no predictions. But listening to you, I think that's spot on, but I didn't re- realize that until you said it. You better. Uh, we'll see. But I think you're. He's, I think you're you absolutely know, right. Now, what's, what else what's, could he say? I guess. Yeah, right. What is the theory of his case? The theory of his case has always been: I didn't lose. I won, and you took it from me. And I, you need a strong leader to prevent this from happening. So he, the theory of his case tonight is that he actually won the midterms, and it was taken away from him. I think you're a pretty good reader, of, of folks. Well, we'll see. We will see. Yep. Okay. Oh, do you think he's going to stand up and talk about, you know, I need to preserve Medicare and Medicaid and I want to get health care to everybody and I want to make sure that, you know, our free enterprise system survives. Do you think he's going to talk like that? No, he's going to talk grievance and, you know, this democracy needs someone like me. I alone can fix it. And I was denied the chance to serve. And there's going to be plenty of taking on Joe Biden and taking on Nancy Pelosi. But for the most part, he's going to take on Republicans. That's my theory. He's going to take on Republicans for being weak and uh, too forgiving of Democrats. And and, and we're going to be in the election denial, you know, 2.0 for another eight months here, nine months. God, you're so smart. I think you're absolutely right. <laughs> I mean, of course you're right. <laughs> well, I wish I were wrong for the democracy. But, you know, I've never heard Trump talk about the importance of Medicare and Medicaid. I think in uh, 16, he did. I think he said he'd strengthen Social Security and Medicare during the campaign. I think he did. Yeah, well, that was a long time ago, Al. Okay, yeah. But, I mean, that was <laughs> one of the – he also said he, uh, you know, he was going to – replace Obamacare with something terrific. He also said he was going to balance the budget while he was spending trillions of, uh, of excess dollars during what he called the greatest economy in the history of forever. He's not a very reliable uh, spokesperson for his policies. Okay, I'm going to write that down. He's not reliable. <laughs> Otherwise, I'll forget that sure as shooting, as we say. So they're going to, it's just going to be a great shit show to watch, isn't it? Well, sure. I mean, you know, I, I I do, as you do, tons of commentary. And, you know, when I'm on with my friends who are more rational Republicans, many of them retired, you know, I just say Donald Trump is the gift that keeps on giving because it reminds us about how weak the rest of you are not to stand up to this. <laughs>
No, seriously. I mean, I just, I, I mean, there, you know who Annie Applebaum is, right? Sure. Um, she's a great writer. She writes for the Atlantic and yeah, she's yeah. a, uh, yeah, she's an expert in post-communist, you know, Cold War, uh, Eastern European politics. And she interviewed a dissident. Um, who fought in East Germany and suffered terrible consequences. And she asked him in this story, she said, so tell me why there weren't more people like you. And he said, well, that's the wrong question. The question is, why would anyone do this? And she made the point in that article that here were people who fought for their democracy, who sacrificed everything, including their freedom and their families' livelihoods. And what do these Republicans you know, risk by standing up to what they know is a person who is incredibly bad for our democracy. They risk re-election. How sad and small of them. How sad and small. Yeah, I have, uh, I won't say who they are, but I have former Republican colleagues who I keep in touch with. It's interesting. Mainly I do it via text. And what's ha- what's funny is I give them shit, I give them shit, I give them shit, I give them shit. And then I say, you know, can I send you a Christmas card? And then they re- reply. <laughs> <laughs> and then I give them more shit. And I give them shit. And I give them shit. And I give them shit. And then I say, uh, how, you know, I heard your mom was sick. How is she? And then they reply. <laughs> and then I give them shit. And I give them shit. And I give them shit. Mainly the shit is not directly saying you're a chicken shit, but implying it, implying it, implying it, implying it, implying it. Yeah. And then I got to do but something I, <laughs> to get him. And I, and I met this student, and this is maybe a little bit too out there for for your podcast. But he's doing a whole thing on in, in his whole area of study at the University of Chicago on the lack of shame. That that one of the things we're missing in our political discourse is people no longer feel ashamed. And and you think about if you're one of these people who have stood on the sidelines and let this man systematically dismantle and work to dismantle our democracy, they have no shame. It's kind of like the McCarthy hearing, you know, do you have no shame? Where is the shame today? Well, let's get into psychology then. Uh, And this is apart from, from politics and just more generally. Are there people who are so naive that they hold themselves naive. They make themselves naive so that they can excuse the fact that they have no shame. Well, well, think about this, Al. I mean, they, they all watch Twitter and, and when you, and you know what that, that whole episode is like when you get off the, the subway down in the, you know, right in the basement of the Capitol and all these reporters run to you and they say, what did, what do you think? What's your reaction to the latest, you know, uh, crazy that came from the former president? And they all go, I didn't see it. I didn't <laughs> see it. Yeah, right. <laughs> you know, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, you know, uh, you know, and, and, you know, the, for our friends who did speak up like uh, Bob Corker, he, I mean, he probably knew he wouldn't get the nomination after he, he, uh, spoke up against Trump. But, you know, there were people, principled people who said this is not good for our country. Jeff Flake and Corker. And I'm trying to think of anybody else um, who is in our body. But of course, Romney has and Romney, you know, but we'll see. Romney's up in two years. We'll see what happens there. But I, I do think there are people who will say things like I didn't hear it, even though they heard it. And not be ashamed of doing that. Of course, they'll just be going like, of course, I just did. the, I said the right thing. I'll be I'm proud of that. <laughs> my my communications team will go way to go, buddy. Or, or think about this, Al. This is a man who literally if we're to if the reports are true, took home the most serious of America's secrets in these documents. And when when they approach members and people that we know and probably like and say, do you think Donald Trump should have done that? Well, I don't want to talk about that. I want to talk about inflation. I mean, the answer is simple. No, he should not have taken those documents and put them in an unsecured you know, hotel. Um, and that was wrong. And, you know, he'll he, he should have sent them back when they asked for him. How is that so hard? You and I would say it if a Democrat did it. 
I, I, chicken shits. That's where I started, yeah. right? They're just chicken <laughs> shits, you know? And whether they have a conscience about it or not, and they don't. <laughs> yeah. They're just chicken shits. That's the party now. It's either chicken shits or, or, or sickos or crazies. Yeah. You know, I always tell people, they say, well, what did Donald Trump bring to the Republican Party? And I said, you know, he brought over a lot of people who had never voted before. I can tell you stories about people in in your state of Minnesota, in western Minnesota, who were just thrilled to go out and vote for him. Hadn't voted for years, but voted for Trump. And the second thing that he did and the more dangerous thing that he did was he invited groups that had never been invited to the party. People like uh, who represent the Proud Boys, the Oath Keepers, the Three Percenters, white supremacists who before, you know, everybody's like, I'm not with you. And Trump calls them, these are my people. I love you very much. And, and the good people, and I use that, the good chicken shit people of the Republican Party stand by and don't even criticize that. They're good people on both sides. And how can you say there are good people on both sides unless you're, um, well, you're Donald Trump? When you go back and kind of review the history, they're just one bit of like, wow, after the other. And I think he just wore it down. He normalized behavior that's never been normalized before in our political discourse, whether it's hypocrisy or whether it is straight up lying or whether it is just I alone am going to do whatever I want to do. And it's OK as long as as long as I still have my 30, 40 percent of the people who will follow me no matter what. And, and again, I, you know, Donald Trump clearly has no shame. And that that's not a word that is or a, or a emotion that has ever entered his vocabulary or his psyche. No, I mean, I can shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and not lose a vote. My response to that was, yeah, but you'd get prosecuted. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I mean, I think. And th- here's the thing about it. I've, I've been uh, first of all, I do believe we dodged a bullet this midterm. Thank God, you know, it wasn't because it could have been the uh, uh, it. When I say it could have been the other way, maybe it couldn't have been. And that's because enough Americans said, stop it. Like Franny said, stop it. So maybe it couldn't have been the other way. But I was worried that it was going to be. You, you must. Like anybody who's been living through this period going like, has there been a tipping point where we can't get our democracy mm-hmm. back? And maybe this was it, but I, I thought that uh, Citizens United was a tipping point, right? Uh, the 2010 elections and all these state legislatures that became Republican state legislatures that then gerrymandered everything. I thought that was the turning point. I thought Shelby County was the turning point. I thought when they didn't take up Merrick Garland and then we got Coney Barrett, that was a huge, huge tipping point. But the biggest tipping point was electing Donald Trump. Because he made this thuggery, he made this hate a viable part of the Republican Party. I mean, a large part of, made it the Republican Party. So I was worried and my God, I was just relieved because I was holding out that it wasn't going to be a red wave. I I was thinking that the Dobbs decision was really going to help us. And that I think that uh, there was this tipping point, whether we our democracy survived was the election of Donald Trump and the introduction of this horrible thuggery and dark sickness that was him that enough of America adopted, along with this uh, disinformation that's just out there all the time and the Bannons and, and those people. And I thought it was we we could have been over the precipice, but this election, I think, you, you know, Al, what I would say is the tipping point in this country is when we no longer operate on a common set of facts. Well, yeah, you know, that's- it, it, and and you know, we all laughed when Kellyanne Conway said alternative facts, but she was absolutely right. They operate under alternative facts. I mean, we used to be able to have at least some discourse on a baseline level of of understanding of the reality, and disinformation has entered, but it has been promoted 
the point when you look at um, disinformation always being out there, where where John McCain is in Minnesota in our you know in our neck of the woods, and a woman says he's Muslim and blah blah blah, and John McCain looks at her and national television, and he said, "No, that's not true, ma'am. He's a family man. You may disagree with his policies." You're mischaracterizing who this human being is. When leaders don't call out disinformation that way, it just takes a life of its own. And so this this sense of common fact has really, I think, been the most critical and dangerous part of the world that we're living in, the world of Kellyanne Conway's alternative facts. It was amazing that she said that, though. But it was putting it right out there. There are alternative facts because there aren't. (laughs) There are facts. And look, when we had only three networks and it was either Cronkite or Huntley Brinkley, and we all dealt with a common set of facts. Sometimes in our history, all those facts weren't facts either. Sometimes when we were a a racist country, a completely racist. You know, I mean, we weren't getting everything, but now we just live in a in a, a world where a huge percentage of people have a set of facts that are just so 180 degrees from reality, and that's a lot of the Republican Party. Again, going back to leadership, I mean, you can disagree about what the consequences are, what what makes sense. I mean, the sun comes up in the east. The earth is, you know, is an orb. It's it's round, not perfectly round, but, you know, we could nitpick that. So wait a minute, are you saying it's round like a plate or like <laughs> a melon? I think it's round like a melon. Okay. Okay. Imperfect as it is, but the, the, you know, <laughs> you know, the, the 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 world that we're living in, where people will believe just absolutely absurd kinds of nonsense and then act on it, like the the young man who went looking for the pedophiles at in the basement of the pizzeria, and there wasn't even a basement. And no one steps back and says, well, I guess we were led in the wrong direction. They just then convert to the next conspiracy theory. And and that's what Donald Trump is so good at stoking that. And that's what he's going to do tonight. He's going to stoke conspiracy because that's the only way he can possibly spin the midterm to say he won. Remember when there used to be uh, a lie of the year? Do you remember that? It was yeah. like Obama said something, you can keep your insurance policy if you want to. And it wasn't true. It wasn't true. And I think he had either read a different iteration of the bill or something, but it wasn't true. And then he apologized for it. <laughs> and then that was called the lie of the year. The lie of the year. Trump, like average several a day. And just the idea of like, it's December 31st, 2017. Uh, What's the lie of the year? (laughs) We got to we got to put one out. We've always put one out. We can't. We can't. You know, if you think about lying and fibbing, let's talk about the difference there. I mean, I think that people were willing to let Trump fib even though their eyes would tell them, guess that inaugural event was not as big as what you said it was. That The thing about Trump that, that conditioned people is he lied about everything. And people were like, yeah, I, I used to ask constituents when I was still in office, they, they would say, well, you know, Donald Trump. And I go, you know, I get that you support the president, but doesn't it bother you that, that he lies? And they look at me like they all lie. So it was like like the whataboutism. It was like completely converting it to they all lie. And I want to say not like that. They don't. But, you know, you, you, <laughs> yeah. you weren't going to you because he was just as adept at fibbing as he was at lying. You know, the, the whole thing about light uh, curing covid. I mean, <laughs> it's just some of the lies were really dangerous. Remember uh, Deborah Burks? She's sitting there going like. Oh, my Lord. And that was you could inject bleach. (laughs) And and then and then later in the debate, 
with Biden. Biden brought that up and Trump says I was being sarcastic. And you know it. <laughs> you remember that? Yeah, no. I, you know, and, and when he gets caught, there's always some kind of, you know, kind of pushback. And I, I can't give you my tax returns because they're an audit. Well, let me tell you, he could release his tax returns tomorrow if he wanted to release them. And people would say, well, sure you can. And he'd just look at his supporters and say, no, I can't release those returns unless I'm in audit, unless I, you know, have my audit resolved. Or I didn't take those documents that he says to the U.S. attorney, but then you find out that he did have those documents. And now he says, well, they became mine the minute they walked out of the, that's his latest filing. Those documents became mine and, and personal property of mine the minute they got shipped to my place in Mar-a-Lago. Well, well actually, know. he said you can declassify them just by thinking it. <laughs> Remember when he said that? Yeah. He's been trying a lot of theories, but the one the one he filed in court, which you have to kind of respect, not respect, but know that his attorneys are going that mine thing that ain't going to sell with the judge. So you better come up with another theory. And his his new theory is what's mine is mine. And, and there is no such thing as a public record. And here's the counterpoint on the what about ism. They talk about, oh, well, Obama took thousands of records. And and the point is that they're still under control of the National Archives, the records that Obama uh, wanted to secure for his presidential library. But none of that gets believed because if you don't want to expose Donald Trump's lies, you just simply turn the table and say, what about this? What about this over here? And that's just, you know, incredible distraction for democracy. I also think that when some of his supporters hear that was a lie and it's proven a lie and they I think sometimes they go, well, that that was smart. You remember when he said you can you can declassify these documents just by thinking it. So uh, Stephanopoulos had uh, John Barrasso on his uh, new show. I think it was uh, on, on the weekend, the uh, ABC one. And uh, the one you are on, I think, sometimes and yeah. and and uh, ask them, can the president declassify documents by just by thinking they're declassified? And Barrasso said, I don't actually know the different processes of declassify. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yeah, and, and, and you have to say, okay, uh, Senator Barrasso, <laughs> would you answer? No, I, I think somebody needs to say, if, if Barack Obama had done this, would that still be your answer? And the answer clearly is no, it would not be your answer. And it was interesting because Chris Christie was on the same week with us and on this week. And Chris Christie said, if, if anybody at this round table had done that, you'd be prosecuted. I mean, at least Christie, you know, he just there's a point at which you can't keep carrying water for somebody who is that big of a liar. Well, he he wrote a book, Republican Rescue. I I read it. He he said that he Biden won the election. But, you know, Chris Christie is running for always wants keeping that running for president option open. And I think he wrote this book saying, "Okay, I'll be the guy. (laughs) who said Biden won in the Republican Party. And maybe that'll be, you know, I'll pick that lane and maybe I'll get that lane. And I remember I did an event with uh, Chris and and we had a good time. But I as soon as I met him, I said, I read your book. I said, you know who comes off really good in your book? You. (laughs) Isn't that right? Well, I mean, okay, so Al, let's let's make some predictions. I, my prediction is Donald Trump announces he's going to run. Okay, right. And everybody thinks DeSantis is going to take him on. I do not. Really? Yeah. Okay, DeSantis won't take him on because DeSantis what? Because too much of crossover and in, in base that he has been uh, too much of a sycophant and who only knows what Trump has on him, right? And and I think, you know, like so many of these folks who have never been on the national stage, they kind of emerge as these larger than life personalities. He is somebody who's never been tested on the national stage. And I think he won't hold up well. I thought Charlie Crist, although maybe a lackluster candidate, kind of won the debate. The other reason why I think that everybody is overestimating him, 
natural disasters tend to rally the flag of voters. This had the hurricane happened right beforehand. I think he would have won without the hurricane, but I think the hurricane gave him a five to seven percent bump. He, and he's going to have to go against type when he's going to be begging for money to recover from the hurricane. Well, except, OK, I just feel like the billionaires may be sensing that Trump can't do it. And we don't know right now. We've seen Trump be completely, you know, we saw the the tape where he talked about grabbing women and you thought that, well, that's over, right? But you don't know, right? Is, is it possible that Donald Trump wins again? <laughs> yeah, I mean, you know. Oh my lord! <laughs> right. So, so I think I think that it's going to be up to you know Holly, Josh Holly, who uh, fortunately I didn't have to serve with. He took Claire's job, which is really a step down for the state of Missouri, in my opinion. Yep. Um, Josh. Uh, Holly said, it's time for a new generation of leaders. Well, what does that mean? Tom Cotton took himself out already, but Josh Holly did not. And so who's going to play for which part of the base? And to me, the kind of old guard, pro-business, pro-free trade, pro-immigration wing of the party is waiting for someone to step up. And where does the money go, Al? Does the money go to Donald Trump or does it go to a candidate that looks like that? Who is that, though? Who is the uh, pro-free trade guy? Well, I think it becomes people like Chris Christie. Oh, I see. Um, You know, Larry Hogan is talking about getting into it. From Maryland. Although I think having led a state, he's got some credibility. So does Chris Christie. But, you know, the question is, if you divide that flank and fractionalize it, you won't win. But does Donald Trump get get legitimate pushback? And, And I and I. It'll be interesting to see what the Carrie Lakes and the Christy Gnomes and the Nikki Haley's, you know, the women on their side, what what they do in response to Trump. I think you and I both agree he's probably going to announce today. Yeah, this is way too early to be looking at that field unless we can say what a terrible person Josh Hawley seems to be. I didn't get the serve him either, and I'm not. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't actually. The more they're in, the more Trump has. You know, the more of them are going like, "I'll be the last one surviving with Trump," and then you know, he he went wins and, with. And 40%. how did that work the last time? Yeah, he systematically yeah. picked them off. Yep. Oh. And, and, <laughs> and Donald Trump has to make himself relevant. He wants to comment on everything that Biden does. He wants to comment on every move that the uh, Senate does, um, every move that the House does. And he he has no legitimacy um, in making those comments unless he he speaks from the platform of a candidate. And and Cruz will run, right? Again, you know, I think I think they're all going to take the wait and see to see if the Donald, uh, you know, starts his star starts waning, but Donald left unchecked with his own base is only going to get more powerful. Okay. Let's uh, go to the other side of the aisle. Let's go to our side of the aisle. Uh, We're going to be in the majority in the Senate. Uh, Republicans have one uh, candidate left uh, for this cycle that they can all get behind. Herschel Walker. It's like if you're a Georgia Republican, you're not going to go, well, uh, we can't even get the majority. So I actually want to go out there and vote for Herschel Walker. (laughs) And I don't want to tell them they don't listen to this podcast. So uh, but it makes a difference whether we have 51 or 50. Right. Because on on committees. Right. uh, You can if you pass legislation out of a committee then you can go right to the floor. You can know, have a floor vote on, on the legislation. If not, you have to have some kind of motion to proceed to something that takes a long time, takes a lot of floor time. So this is kind of an important election. But look, don't tell any, any Republicans that, uh, Republican voters that, because they're going to have to say, should I, okay, I, I did vote for him, <laughs> the general. It's not that important anymore. And uh, he will, again, be the gaffe machine that keeps on giving. And so if you're a smart Republican, the last thing you want is to elect Herschel Walker to represent your party because he will um, not represent your party 
uh, well. Um, he already hasn't. And on the flip side of this, and this is this is what I would say to anyone on the other side listening to this podcast. You told us that you believe in life at conception, that you believe that the Republican Party is the party of pro-life. You have a candidate who literally purchased, uh, under your theory, the death of, of at least two children that we know of. And, and you said you're going to vote for him because the Senate, keeping control of the Senate is the most important issue. Well, now that's not on the ballot. You've lost control of the Senate. So why would you vote for this person? Yeah, I'll answer for them. Why would you be motivated to vote for this person? I'll answer for him, them. He said he didn't. Yeah, do you think people believe that? <laughs> no. I, no. <laughs> but that doesn't <laughs> stop them from saying... Well, he said he didn't. I know the check, the checks, and I know, <laughs> but yeah, he said I, he didn't. I mean, yeah, I mean, you know, so so this is so that destroys your argument, is, to, Heidi. To me, to me, <laughs> Al, then evangelicals should never say they're a religious organization; they're a political organization. Well, evangelical. There's different kinds of evangelicals. There's evangelicals, religious evangelicals, and then there's evangelical. Uh, political evangelicals. There are evangelicals who vote Democratic. Jimmy yeah. Carter won probably a plurality, if not majority, of evangelicals. Right? Uh, they just became. What? Why did the evangelicals? It was. It was. Was it abortion? Is that what it is? Or yeah. no? They also evangelicals became very organized right wing. They had right wing radio. They have. Uh, that's part of the disinformation too. Is evangelical Christian radio right? Beth Moore, who is an interesting telephonic preacher, you can see her on religious channels, very spiritual. And, and she made a call out to people who, um, who are in the flock saying, look, we, we owe our allegiance to God not to, and to Jesus Christ and not to a political leader. You know, and so I think you see some erosion in that kind of hardcore base, but it'll be interesting to see. I think I think the test of this is going to be Herschel Walker's uh, special election. How many people will come out in spite of his failings? And and you know he's got a son who literally is sounding the alarm to conservatives, saying, "Look, you can say what you want about my father, but he's not uh, an ethical Christian man." You know, uh, well, that's pretty damning, it seems to me. I'm pretty certain he's going to lose. But that, uh, listen, I'm giving as much money and getting as much money to Unite Here, the hospitality workers who are now going to Georgia and on the ground, just like they were for Ossoff and Warnock in the, in the last special. We're going to win this. I really believe it. And I do believe it is because there are a lot of Republicans who or, or conservatives who voted for him the first yeah. time and went like, ah, ah, ah. this is the really sad commentary is that Reverend Warnock, Senator Warnock is a good, good man. If you want to elect good people, ethical people, moral people, people who care about other, something other than their political career. You couldn't find a better example of that in, in, you know, throughout the country. I think he's, you know, I don't think he's politically ambitious. I think he just wants to do the right thing for the people of Georgia and the people of this country. It's like compared to somebody who is just an opportunist who moved there from Texas, who Donald Trump tried to make into a United States senator, there just is no comparison. And it bothers me that political pundits keep treating Herschel Walker as if he is a normal you know, challenger to an incumbent. Okay, let's say Walker does win. Let's say this for a second. Would you be really surprised if like 30 years from now, people go like, you know, what a surprise. Herschel Walker turned up to be one of the great senators <laughs> in the history oh, well, of the Senate. 
<laughs> Wasn't that a surprise? <laughs> you know, I, I can't imagine what kind of disgusting thing I could promise to do if I ever let those words come out of my mouth. But I am telling you, that will not happen. I'm not concerned about that. I'm, I'm, uh, I have no concern at all. I think that that um, I'll make a bet. Yeah, I'll make a bet. <laughs> Thirty years from now, Al, when we're gumming our food in the nursing home together, we'll 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 figure it out. Um, you know. It's a big, is not, you're not going to like the odds. Yeah, well, it's a billion he's, he's, to one. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm putting a penny on it. <laughs> yeah, by then, oh inflation won't, won't make a big difference. No, I, I just like that idea. I like that. that, that you did too. That was a. A funny idea. <laughs> yeah. Well, I mean, here's a here's an example of someone I think who stepped up to the challenge, and and you may say it was not enough, but John Cornyn. You know, I've known John Cornyn. We were we were attorneys general together. He when he was attorney general in in Texas, and so you know, always considered him a hardcore partisan. When the shooting happened, the, the school shooting in Texas, he really engaged with Chris Murphy, uh, one of our great new leaders in uh, in Connecticut, and and stepped up and said, I'm going to do the right thing and talk about what we need to do in this country to stop this. You know, good for John Cornyn. If you, if you go to Todd Young, um, another person that doesn't get talked enough about who really took on the establishment to pass the CHIPS Act. There are people who have surprised me and who have demonstrated leadership in the last um, uh, two years of this Congress. Um, I do have no hesitation in saying Herschel Walker will not be someone who will ever surprise me. Well, uh, you know, I did some bills with John Cornyn and um, he did crisis intervention training with me. So I did work with him. And there, yes, there are worse. <laughs> <laughs> I agree with you. Uh, they're far worse, far worse. OK, Democrats, Democrats, Democrats. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? What are we going to be able to do? We got uh, we're probably almost certainly in the minority, maybe by just a little bit. Or maybe by a little bit, and then we we will have the majority in the Senate, either by one or you know a, a fifty fifty with the vice president or uh, fifty one. What are we going to do? How does this work? Well, I, I mean, I think that um, hopefully we have fifty one so that the committees um, uh, have a majority Democrat body, and I think that. Now there is going to be a lot of discussion about implementation of the legislation that has already passed, whether it is the infrastructure bill, whether it's the Inflation Reduction Act, which has enormous benefits for climate in that embedded yep. in that bill. And so I think a lot of what they were able to do, they did the first two years, which was really smart. So the question becomes, if, if student loans stall out, what do, we, what do we do to help students who are underwater with student debt? There's a lot of strategies the administration can pursue. But I think for the most part that we're going to go right into obstruction in the House. I think that there will be members of the Republican Party who will try and obstruct any advancement of agenda on the Democrat side. The one thing I wish we would do, if you said, hey, put out the wish list, what's number one on that wish list, it would be immigration reform. And, and I think there's a possibility of doing that. We did it um, way back in, in 2013, uh, 68 votes uh, in the Senate, and then the House stopped it. Uh, I'm wondering if they're going to do their, uh, their thing where you need a majority of the majority to pass something. Remember that? Um, yeah. Uh, well, you I, mean over I, in the House? Yeah, that's what I meant, in the House. That stopped stuff. I think you already see the moderate congressman from Omaha um, basically saying, look, you know, I want someone moderate. I don't want a fire breather. You saw it in New York. One of the new congressmen in New York saying, I'm not, I didn't come here to investigate anybody. I came here to deliver results for uh, New York. I think you're going to see a crime bill that probably has some criminal justice reform. We'll see if, if that makes its way to the floor. But Kevin McCarthy is not going to want to give a win. And so I don't even think it's a majority of the uh, it's a majority of the majority. I think that what you're going to see is investigations, investigations, investigations. 
live to fight another day. And I think that they would be afraid to advance any legislation because I think the moderates will have huge sway in the Republican caucus in the House and be able to kind of have their way with legislation. I don't know what unites this Republican House in terms of agenda except for investigation. Okay, so what you're saying is that the moderate uh, representative from upstate New York or from Omaha who said, I'm not here to do investigations, they're not going to win. They're not going to do, that's not going to happen. Speaking of investigations, could the House, and I, Neil Katyal uh, suggested this, I saw him, suggested that the House just refers the January 6th committee to the Senate. I, I, there's there's a lot of dialogue about that. Um, I think that the House committee is going to want to finish up their work and take credit for the extensive work that they did. And so this idea that we're going to let business be unfinished and just turf it over to the Senate. Well, can't they write the report and then do that? I mean, in other words, when are they going to write the report and issue it after they're no longer in the ma- majority? No, gonna- I think they're going to try and get it done by the end of the year. So if they get it done by the end of the year, can't they also by the end of the year just say, OK, and we hereby now pass it off to the United States Senate with all the stuff we got. And the staff director uh, will be uh, Liz Cheney. Well, I, I, I think January 6th, the next move on January 6th is within the Department of Justice. What does that look like? They're already prosecuting um, uh, the most serious crimes with the Oath Keepers uh, litigation that's ongoing, criminal litigation. It'll be interesting to see what our friend Dick Durbin does with all of this. He's going to be the chair of the Judiciary Mm -hmm. Committee again. Do they kind of look at this and say it's now up to the Department of Justice to take all this amazing data and decide whether this is, you know, what the indictments look like? Or do they... Uh, continue the dialogue in the Senate. And to me, the Senate hasn't demonstrated, even though they could have, uh, although, again, a 50-50 committee, that this is something that they want to want to pursue. Can you imagine what that would be like taking up in Judiciary Committee uh, with Cruz and Holly and Cotton and Lee and investigation of, on, of January 6th? If there ever was an unforced error in the history of being in the minority, Kevin McCarthy not holding his nose and appointing new people to that committee was a big mistake. Yep. Good for him. And I, what are the chances of him not being the speaker? Uh, zero. Who else really? wants the job? Okay. All right. You know, one of us could be. <laughs> Well, you know, as I said before, there was that rumor that Liz Cheney was going to do it. Um, I don't think she wants the job. I think she's getting geared up to maybe run for president. When you say who's who's on the wings, you know, it wouldn't surprise me if within a couple of months of, of Trump announcing, she announces her exploratory committee because that woman is one tough woman and I would not get in her way. Yeah. That'd be that'd be interesting to see, and uh, but you see, she didn't win in Wyoming. I'll tell you that. Yeah. And, well, I mean, but but she's not she's not doing this to win necessarily. Oh, I see. Okay, of course, of course. All right. Well, uh, Heidi, always great. And by the way, I should you're you're going to be the uh, director now of the Institute of Politics at the uh, at the University of Chicago. Yep. And that's uh, the big shoes to fill. Uh, that's uh, David Axelrod's. And when do you come in? When do you start? January 3rd. I'm going to start, but we've already been doing some transition stuff. There's a great team at the University of Chicago, led by great administration at the University of Chicago. It's a place of free expression. My daughter was an alum there. And I remember when Darwin and I dropped her off, the school's motto was where fun goes to die. Um, you know, <laughs> yes. I don't know that that's necessarily true. I don't think they like getting that repeated. But, you know, for the most part, it's a pretty serious or uh, institution. And and I think one of the things I want to say about Gen Z and about the, the new people coming up, everybody kind of says, oh, they're just these starry eyed 
uh, outrageous liberals. But when you drill down with them, there's a pragmatic streak. They're tired of things not getting done, and they want to know what the path forward is, whether it's on climate, whether it is on gender, gender issues, whether it is on just making sure that they have an ability to come into the middle class and and be successful in life. Kids are really smart. And if, if, if anybody that's listening to this feels discouraged about America, I say go to a college campus and visit with the young people who are there. They're doing amazing things. Or at least the University of Chicago. <laughs> because- well, I've spent, I spent time at Brown. I spent a year at Brown. I spent mm-hmm. uh, a half a year at Harvard. And my experience in all of these institutions with young people has been this pragmatic streak that they never get credit for. Uh, thank you, Heidi. You bet, Al. Thanks for all the time. Well, I, I hope you enjoyed uh, listening. That beautiful music is by Leo Kotke, the great Leo Kotke. I want to thank Peter Ogburn for producing this podcast. We'll talk again next week. Mm-hmm.